Uh, well, I've been a professional fundraiser for over 30 years, but I guess I've always been an intuitive fundraiser. And I remember as a child getting involved in organising some activities that raise money for the local hospital and one of the local charities. So it's something I've always loved to do. Um, but I started my career 30 years ago and I've been a fundraising director for seven or eight um, large charities, actually primarily working across disability, children and medical causes. Um, but a wide variety. And then a few years ago, I decided to set up my own consultancy. So what I do now is I advise charities and support them in developing their fundraising. Um, but in addition to that, there's a couple of other things I do. So I, I, have, um, I get involved with some training and I train fundraisers. We have a, a series of courses we run called If Only I'd Known That Earlier, which is giving people a kind of deep dive into different aspects of fundraising. And I enjoy doing that three or four times a year. And I also run a networking organization for fundraisers because sometimes it can be a bit of a lonely business. Um, and then occasionally I'm poacher turned gamekeeper and I work as a grant assessor, assessing grants for one of the major grant givers, which is great to do because it gives me that other perspective from the other side of the desk where I'm looking at what makes a great application. Thanks. And um, what is your specific interest in trusts and foundations? Well, you know, I guess that when I started as a professional fundraiser, um, trusts and foundations was one of the first things I started to work on. And the great thing about fundraising from trusts and foundations is normally you have to persuade somebody that philanthropy or giving should be something that they consider. And then you have to persuade them that your organisation is the organisation that they might like to support. But when you're working with trusts and foundations, 50% of that is already done. They've already made the decision that they want to give away money. So actually what you need to do is to make sure that your cause is aligned with their mission. So that in, in many respects makes the job a little bit easier. Um, and trusts and foundations is a very interesting part of fundraising. It engages people with, um, with different causes. You need to have great writing skills. Uh, you need to be able to put your case across in a variety of different ways. So it's always very interesting from a fundraising point of view. It's something that is a nice thing to do. So what is the role of trust and foundations in the fundraising mix? I know you've touched on that, but... Um... Well, trust and foundation fundraising is an important part of the fundraising mix. It's um, one of those areas where the return on investment is high. In fact, it's the second highest return on investment um, against the, the only thing that out, out manoeuvres it is, is legacy fundraising. And obviously the lead time on legacy fundraising is considerably longer. So as a fundraiser, you can expect a return on investment usually within a year. Uh, which is a very positive thing for many small charities. And that um, average return on investment is usually around 10 to 1, which outperforms many other areas. Uh, there are some disadvantages, uh, such as the fact that very often those gifts are restricted. But trusts and foundation fundraising is an important part of the mix for, I would say, most charities. Does this differ across um, cause or size of organisation? Um, it's different for every organisation, so some charities will find it more difficult than others. For example, if you're a charity that has very high levels of reserve, that can be very off-putting for trust and foundation funders. Um, if you're a charity that has been set up by a family in response to a particular personal interest, often trusts worry if all of the trustees are related. So there can be things that would flag up for a trust and foundation that this organisation might be one that it would be easier to say no to. So some organisations will have it harder than others. Um, but actually, it should be part of the mix, I think, for the majority of charities. So how does one go about developing a trust or foundation strategy? Well, like with all strategies, you know, start with getting to understand your organisation. Uh, SWOT analysis is always a good place to start. 
So you're looking at the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and, and threats that might impact on your trust fundraising. And you're looking at the external environment too. And take a good hard look at your organisation. Try and stand in the donor's shoes and see what they would see. So you need to make sure that you're ready to go ahead with this type of fundraising. And that means looking at your processes and your administration. You need to make sure that, for example, if you've sent an application off, your donor or potential donor may give you a call. Is the person who answers the phone going to be able to put them through to the right person? Are they going to respond appropriately? Is there someone who's going to sound caring and interested and pleased to hear from them? If you're sending them some information, is your information consistent? I can't tell you how many times as a grant assessor, I've looked at an annual report and seen the figures in the annual report don't match the figures that have been put in the application. So make sure you don't make any silly mistakes and that everything is consistent. Are the messages consistent? Are your values aligned with the values of the trust that you're applying to? Make sure that your organisation is ready to take this on. And when people come and visit, are there going to be people that they meet who are well briefed, understand the questions that they might have and are looking forward to sharing their work with them? All of these things are really important. So prepare well before you even put pen to paper. Make sure all of those processes are in place. Make sure you've looked at if there are any areas that might cause a trust concern. And make sure you've got the answers to those questions. So if, there's a, if you've got large reserves because you might be planning for, say, a capital appeal in three years' time, make sure that you're prepared and that you're ready to answer any questions that might be thrown at you. So what is the best way to approach a trust and foundation in the first instance? Well, of course, the answer to that is it depends who they are. So all trusts have got different criterias. They work in different ways. You might be working with a small family trust that meets um, infrequently, perhaps every six months, and they get around a kitchen table and make their decisions. You might be working with a well-resourced large trust that has regular monthly meetings and, a, and a, a resource, a team of people who work on that trust. So you need to understand the organisation that you're approaching and how they might like to work with you. And I always think that if possible, the best thing to do is to ask them. Ask them how they like to receive information, um, what format works for them. Do they want a lot of information, a little bit of information? Many trusts receive many hundreds of applications a week. And so they are ploughing through masses of information and they want that to be very succinct. Others, um, you know, are quite happy to receive large quantities of information and want to really immerse themselves in it. Fundraisers are very generous with their time and their information. It's a profession where people are always willing to share information and to talk about their own experiences. There are lots of uh, um, networking and chat rooms that you can go on to to ask questions, to share information with others. So if you're applying to a charity for the, or charitable trust for the first time, why not look at some of the charities that they've already supported and talk to one of the fundraisers in that organisation and learn from their experiences. So where and how does one find out about the trusts and foundations that are suitable for your cause? Luckily, there's lots of information available. So um, one of the main resources that most people will plug into are some of the very good publications which are also available online from the Directory of Social Change. But you can get a lot of information locally too. If you're a small charity, people like the Small Charities Coalition have got a wealth of information and also have um, sources of funding listed on their website which they keep regularly updated. Make sure that you sign up to as many resources as possible. Um, so different grant funders will um, regularly blog about new streams of income. And actually be prepared to be curious and a bit of a detective. So make sure that you follow paths that lead you into understanding more about people who are willing to give and, how they're, and the nature of their philanthropy. Talk to lots of other people. So make sure that you've um, shared information with others and that you've sought advice from other fundraisers who can be a tremendous source of help. Make sure that you've checked out annual reports, you've looked on the Charity Commission website, 
you've read as much as possible. It's much better to do a thorough piece of work and make sure that your applications are properly tailored and properly aligned with the mission of the funder rather than just sending out a large number of poorly constructed applications to a large number of funders. So can you expand on what would make a good trust application then? Okay, so there's lots of things that make an application far more accessible to a donor and far more likely to succeed. First of all, avoid the charity speak and the waffle. Avoid too many acronyms. People don't understand those acronyms. They might be something that you use as shorthand every day in your organisation, but your application needs to be understood by a 12-year-old. Give your application to somebody who doesn't know what you do and make sure that when they've read it, they completely get what you're trying to achieve. So that's the first thing. Avoid, avoid jargon and avoid waffle. Nobody wants to see the same piece of information written in 14 different ways. They already have enough to read, so be succinct. And then think carefully about these points. So first of all, number one, what is the problem that you are trying to solve? Be able to be clear about that and be able to explain that problem within the word count that the organisation might want. So some people will want you to have a free hand and give you as many words or characters as you like to explain that problem, but other people will want you to explain it in 200 characters. So you'll need to have um, the ability to put your case in different ways. So what's the problem you're trying to solve? Stage two, what is the solution to that problem? What do you think needs to be done in order to solve that problem? And why have you come to that, come to that view? What, what learning has made you think, if we do this, this will solve the problem? The next thing to think about is what are the outcomes that will come from you undertaking this piece of work? So think about how you're going to know if you're succeeding in solving that problem and how you're going to measure those outcomes and evaluate them because that's something that your funder is going to want to know. So what are the outcomes? You don't need loads but you do need maybe three to five clear outcomes. And Just a bit of a side tip here. I would say that when I'm assessing the words it will increase their confidence, it will increase their self-esteem um, appear in probably 95% of the applications that I receive. So think about whether there's a way you can explain what you're doing in perhaps a fresh way. Having determined the outcomes that you think you will achieve from your project, you then need to be able to explain what the impact of those outcomes will be. So this is where you're looking at the bigger picture. You may well be making um, a difference in the day-to-day -day lives of people, but what impact will that have on society in the community that they, in which they live and operate? So you then need to stand back a bit and be able to explain that impact. Um, and you need to be able to think about how that impact might be measured in the future. You then need to have a very clear budget. What is this going to cost in order to do it? And that budget, as I've said previously, needs to align with other information that you're giving the funder. So we're looking at the problem, the solution, the outcomes, the impact, the budget, and the measurement of those outcomes and the evaluation of that. So the way that you can do that, the way you can bring it to life for the person reading it, is by including some quotes or some real life stories or some examples of how your work has made a difference to people. And that could be a story from somebody who's benefited from your work, or it could be a quote from somebody who's delivering the work. It, there's a, a lots of different options for you, but try, even if it's only a sentence, to include something that will bring it to life for the person reading it. So what must one avoid when applying to trusts and foundations? Well, I've, all, I've already said you need to avoid, avoid jargon and you certainly need to avoid waffle and repeating yourself too much. Um, I would say one of the most important things is to avoid being boring. As someone who has to sometimes read a large number of applications, it can be really quite hardcore at times. So try and make your application um, interesting, informative, 
and something that someone is going to enjoy reading. Uh, and make it accessible. Think about the person who's reading it. You may need to make it particularly accessible for people um, who have difficulties in reading normal text. So sometimes you might need to put an application into um, a format where people can hear it or even you could add film to your case. So think of ways that you might be able to make that application more interesting and avoid boredom at all costs. If you can include a link to a piece of film, that's great, but think about the other ways you can bring it to life. So once the Trust and Foundation has funded you, how do you look after your supporters? Looking after that relationship is one of the most important jobs of a fundraiser. So the first thing to do is to listen to that donor. Obviously, the first thing you're going to do is thank them. And you need to think about how you're going to do that. Is it going to be you that writes a thank you letter? Are you going to get your chief executive or one of the service users to ring them? Are you going to send them a quick video clip with everyone in the office raising a cheer? You know, how are you going to do that thanking process and what's going to make it stand out? and what's appropriate for that particular funder. And then you need to think about how you are going to steward that relationship and what do they want. So often people will tell you what they want to receive. They'll say they want to receive a report on specific dates and they'll tell you what they want that report to contain. So it's very important that you actually make sure that you do what they've asked you to do and what you've said you will do and report back to them in that way. But also I think you need to think carefully about how you can do more than that, how you can go the extra mile, how you can develop the relationship with that funder. And um, one of the things to say is that you always need to operate with tremendous integrity and honesty. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, funders often have specific requirements. And one of the funders I received quite a large trust donation from had specifically said that they didn't want to appear in any annual report. But somehow, as an organisation, we managed to get it wrong. And our annual report was printed with a list of donors and they were included in it. And there was nothing else to do but to ring them and explain that and be prepared, if necessary, to put that right. So I spoke to the Trust and I said I was dreadfully sorry. We didn't... Um, we didn't quite know how we'd managed to make this mistake, but we realised immediately it was a mistake. We hadn't circulated the document and we were prepared to reprint it if that was something they wanted us to do. And they very generously said, no, don't worry, we don't want you to go to the expense of reprinting it. But it's fortuitous that you phoned because actually we've had a, a tranche of money that's become available that we weren't expecting. So if you were to put in a further application this afternoon, we may well be able to give you another grant. So there's an example of how something that's gone wrong by dealing with it with honesty and integrity has actually turned, turned the whole situation around and has strengthened the relationship with the funder. And I always like to think about how I might surprise and delight a funder. So if your funder is funding a particular project, it's really great if you are actually visiting that project to do a quick bit of film perhaps on your phone and text it to the trust to say, thought you might like to see this. This is what I saw when I was visiting the project today. Anything you can do to strengthen and deepen that relationship so that that funder starts to feel a real part of what you're doing. And the gift that they've given is something that gives them tremendous satisfaction because they're learning all the time about how their generosity and their philanthropy has made a difference to others, which is, after all, why they set up their foundation in the first place. Thank you. So what is the role of the trust fundraiser specifically? Well, a trust fundraiser is a facilitator. So what you are doing is you are connecting the person with the money to the people that need support. And actually, I always tell people that the charity should almost take a step back. This is about allowing a funder to realise their dreams and their purpose. And it's about making that, that as easy for them as possible. So whilst um, it's fine to obviously talk about what your charity does, I think you should always position it that this is about the donor making a difference to the beneficiary and not making a difference to the charity. I read lots of applications that say, would you help XYZ charity to do this? Rather than saying, 
would you make a difference to these people, to this mission, to this cause? So try and step back and realise that you are a conduit that enables people to realise their dreams and make a difference to the lives of others. And that can be one of the most satisfying things that you will ever do. Thank you. And finally, what are your top tips or warnings? Okay. Well, my, my top tips are do your work thoroughly. You are a professional. This, you are privileged to be doing this job. I think that fundraising is one of the best jobs in the world and it's a privilege to do it. It's such a privilege to be able to connect people who can make a difference to the causes that need someone to support them. So do your job as a professional, do your work thoroughly. Don't cut corners, it's not satisfying for you and it won't get you the results that you you're wanting and it won't help your beneficiaries. So, you know, make sure that you are professional, honest, that you operate with integrity, you do your research properly, but also have some fun with it. Think about how you can make it an enjoyable experience for your funder, how they can get the most out of their philanthropy and their giving, and how you can surprise and delight. Make sure that you're passionate, there was a lot of discussion a few years ago about whether passion was important in fundraising. Well, I put my hand up and say that I think passion in fundraising is absolutely essential. And most of all, get up every morning with a determination, a positive attitude and enjoy your job. You're lucky to be doing it and it's one of the greatest careers there is. So another important thing to consider is to build your own networks. Get to know the people in the profession that you're working in. Get to know the funders, talk to them, make sure that they remember you and also build your networks in the fundraising world. So talk to other people working in the same profession, learn from them, use everything as an opportunity to learn. It's the way you make your job more enjoyable too.